welcome Mark. Well, it's a bit tough coming in after those two ladies, isn't it? Um, so I'm the light relief, uh, sadly, at the end of the day. Um, so maybe, um, you know, Tamara, you got me thinking about MIT. You mentioned MIT earlier on. Maybe I'll kick off with a story about MIT. And MIT are a university in America, in Boston, obviously. Their story, their boast, um, is that if you took all the revenue from all the companies that came out of MIT and the founders and people that went through, they'd be the ninth largest economy in the world, which I thought was pretty cool. And they came out here to do the MIT boot camp, which has only been done once outside of the US for QUT. Did anyone hear that this thing was on? And there we go. You did it. Well done. And so I spoke at that, at the start of that, and did a longer story of the Blue Sky story and a very personal one, and spent some time with everybody over those few days. And, and, um, and the guy that was running it, Brian, who's Spanish, and I don't think that's a Spanish name at all, so I'm going to call him Julio. Julio. <laughs> Julio said to me at the end, he says, Mark, you know, after spending some time with you, I have my takeaway. I said, what's that? He says, if you can do it, anybody can. <laughs> he, I think he was trying to give me a compliment, but it, it didn't work so well. But it's sort of true, actually. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm constantly amazed when I sit down and listen to the stories of, you know, Tamara's journey and I know Susanna and her family. And in fact, Susanna and I are now sitting on the board of Racing Queensland trying to fix that mess together, uh, hopefully bringing a different perspective to that industry. And my story, um, uh, which I'll go through very quickly and then try and give some takeaways for you. Uh, I, I'm from a little town, Warren, which is west of Dubbo. This is the first time in 10 years it's been good to be from New South Wales. And, uh, or 11 years, like 27 years, whatever it is. And anyway, and, um, and so uh, really, in, I'm 45, so really, it's amazing how the, the world's changed. And the little town I lived in, uh, for those of you that are a little bit older, we had a party line that we used to have to do three things. And then it would put us through to the lady, Mabel, in the exchange. And then she would connect up some wires for us to talk to our other people in town. And here we are today with all the technology and everything else that's happening. And this was a really insulated life. I mean, we had one television station. It was ABC. Uh, we used to think that Pot Black, which is a snooker show, was a good show to watch. And there was the goodies and Doctor Who and all this, uh, what else is there? Kenny Everett video show. And it's a really insulated background. We moved up to Moree. I went to boarding school uh, at a place called Farrah Memorial Agricultural High School, which is in Tamworth. Uh, it's on a farm. It's 21 kilometres out of Tamworth. All boys, which is bad. And, uh, and we had six years there. I moved there when I was 11. Uh, I was there until I was 17. I uh, can't remember a single day that I enjoyed. Um, hated every minute that I was there. Could not wait to get out. And ended up going to University of Queensland to study agricultural science because I didn't know anything else that was on the list. I uh, looked at everything. I didn't know what commerce law was. Like I knew what doc medical stuff was, but my marks were horrific. So quite frankly, it was quite a small list of things I could do. Interestingly, one of them was, account was accountancy. Anyway, um, <laughs> that's not true. I just made that up. But, um, <laughs> and so I couldn't really, you know, I didn't really know what else to do. But at least, you know, I went to university, went to Emmanuel College at UQ. Uh, confidence is a really important thing. And over the course of those four years at Emmanuel, had the opportunity to build some great friendships, rebuild my confidence. You know, I filled out a bit, I got bigger, I started playing rugby, which is important for boys, and all those things. And, and at the end of it, I had the good sense to know that I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I was sure, was sure that it wasn't agriculture. Um, and so I backpacked around the, year for a, uh, of the world for a year to see what else was out there. And I had a cunning plan at the end of that. I worked out that if I... I, I, mean, I had to leverage off what I had, which wasn't very much, uh, so I did two things, is I got a job as an agronomist, which is, you know, glorified buck checker on the Darling Downs. I was living at, Tem at uh, Toowoomba and working out of Pittsworth. I was checking broccoli and cotton. So I was literally run across these fields and open up the broccoli and the cotton and check for insects. And I'd tell the farmer, you know, what he should spray and what fertiliser he should use. I was really bad at it, uh, as you are, of things that, um, that you don't enjoy. Uh, and then at 22, when I was doing that job, I just had this day where I just decided, I, mean, I remember looking at my boss going past in his car and my path was going to be that one day I would be the guy in that car. And I didn't want that to be my story. 
And so I thought, well, how am I going to change my story? So I sent my CV on a dot matrix printer to 100 people that mum and dad knew. There's no LinkedIn, there's no email, there's no... I had no network, nobody knew I existed and nobody would have cared. And I sent this thing around the world to everyone that mum and dad knew, which is the power of networks, which is, you know, what this is all about, really, at the end of the day, stories and networks. And well done for putting this on too, John. And, um, and so I sent this CV around, and a few months later I got this call like this random call from a guy in Sydney, and he said, um, he said to me, uh, Mark, um, there's a company in Alabama, a Jewish family, uh, that were looking for a young guy under 26 because of visa requirements, had to be a guy because of the country they were gonna work, countries they were going to work in, which were a bit dangerous, that would like to come over and work for them and do a trainee job, uh, and then you can become a cotton trader. And I was in Pittsworth. I said, that'd be fantastic. This is my dream job. And, I, <laughs> and Montgomery was a big Maury, as it turns out. But anyway, um, and I got lucky. I walked into this family business. Um, you know, they'd been there since the Civil War. Six generations of learning, of trading, of investing. They had 30 Monets. They had a uh, Michelangelo sculpture. They had a Ming Dynasty table that I ruined with a coffee cup stain. Uh, yeah, I know. I made them a lot of money. They always said it wasn't enough to pay for the table. And... Um, and so I got this job with this family, and they were amazing. I mean, this intergenerational, they're hugely philanthropic, their values were incredible, and they took me under their wing as if I was family. I mean, how lucky at 23 or 24 or whatever I was. And so I worked for them for eight years, and I used that to... Um, I did a finance degree, the, what was the old securities course, um, and did a stream. I streamed down into Treasury to become good at options and futures, and I quite liked that. I still wasn't very good. I wasn't smart enough to do, get good marks, but I was smart enough to work at how it all worked, and then I applied that to my work. And then I uh, did an MBA. And what happens on these journeys is um, you're setting yourselves up. What I realised, like I thought that life was sort of this, you know, if you talk to your parents, like life's this sort of bunch of step change things that just sort of happen, like you get to 30 and you get married or whatever and you have kids and you get a degree and you'll definitely get a job and all this stuff and then your life path is laid out for you. Well, that's not how it works at all, sadly. And so what I discovered was is that it actually is random moments that you have to win to change your life. And so uh, I was doing my MBA and the smart thing I did about my MBA was that it was at UQ and I did one subject at a time to sort of learn it and then go and do it in the business to see if it worked. And a lot of it didn't work, but there's sort of this, I built this toolkit of stuff that I could use that worked for me. And, um, and I love telling this story. So it was my third degree. I'm not very smart, as it turns out. I haven't had any high distinctions, not even when I was cheating. And, <laughs> and so I've had no high distinctions. And we had this, I love telling this story, but a Swiss lecturer, a Swiss German lecturer, you know, Swiss Germans straight down the line and Swiss German lecturer, his name was Jürgen or something, and he was overdoing the overdoing the, it was Julio, we'll call him Julio, and so he's overdoing the, um, you know, they like to get out of the winter in Northern Europe, so he was over from one of the big business schools, and I was doing strategy over the summer school, and, um, and he said to me, uh, at the end of that, he was leaving before we'd sort of finished everything, and he said, um, Mark, I'm going to give you a high distinction. I said, why would you do that? I haven't worked any harder than I've worked in anything else. He said, I know. He said, but... Um, you're connecting the dots differently to everybody else. He said, your level's different to everybody else in this room. There's 80 people here and you're the only one doing this. He said, this is your special skill. And I've spoken to all of your other lecturers. You need to do something with this because they tell me you have no other skills. <laughs> so you get this massive compliment, high distinction, massive lows. And, but this is where the seed is sown. And, I, and he walks off. Like, you know, it's one of those things just outside the lecture theatre. He walks off. And he, um, I said, what do I do with that, Jürgen? And he goes, I don't know, have a look at private equity. I'm like, what's private equity? It's 2002, what's private equity? I don't know what private equity is. Someone had a look. And it looked pretty cool. Uh, so I thought I'd just do that. And I thought I'd start a turnaround company because I'd come back to Australia, turned around a business for the, uh, the Jewish family in the US, my friends for life, and, um, and turned their business around, finishing my MBA. Business is set. It's sort of in the, what do you call it, the step? It's... It's flat. That's as big as they're going to let it get. So I needed to jump out and do something else. I saw there was a business that was going broke in Adelaide. I went down to fix that for three years. I knew that I didn't know enough, so I went and did something differently, different to learn. And then at 35, uh, July 2006, had the cunning plan to start Blue Sky Private Equity, um, which was simply so that I could do what I thought I liked doing, which was building businesses on steroids. 
which is I'd be building our business and I'd be helping other people build their businesses. I thought that would be really cool. I've got no finance background at all. I've got a pretty ordinary academic record. I've turned around two businesses now. The second one was much harder uh, and for a whole range of reasons. And, and then came into this business and just started it. I had no business plan. Uh, and I just started sort of doing stuff that made sense. And by, by then, my big advantage, and everyone always tells you in these talks, I spoke to lots of people, they tell you, we'll just go and hire good people. Well, shit, I don't know what a good person looks like. I mean, I keep hiring morons. And so, so you've, you've got to work out, this is really important, you've got to work out how to get up the experience curve really quickly. Like experience and age are correlated. How do you get yourself up the experience curve? Because the two things that are really hard to find are commercial judgment and the willingness and ability to make decisions. And they are linked. And if you find people that can do both of those things or you can get yourself to that point, then for God's sake, grab them. They're your rainmakers. They are the rare breed, trust me, that doesn't exist anywhere. And Rob Shant, who's running Blue Sky now, is one of the very few people that I've seen that can do that. And he's a natural leader as well and quite bright, which sort of helps. And the girls tell me he's a bit hot. So anyway, <laughs> moving on from Rob. Um, so we started this business. And uh, this time is not going by the way. How long have I got? Keep going, man. Okay. So I'll, I'll try and rush it through, sorry. And, um, and so we started this business, and, uh, and the next sliding door for me was, I mean, remembering this is July 2006, so what's just around the corner, 18 months later, with an investment business with no capital and no one that backed us and no banking background or investment banking background is the GFC. And in October 2007, I had the good sense to know, like I'd started doing some private, some, my first deal was a startup, which is Beach Burrito Company, a Mexican restaurant chain. Then a dunny business, Viking Rentals, and we started doing some private equity into real estate. I had this idea on a water fund, and we were sort of, our DNA was taking us in, in this direction, but you can't get to where you're going if you don't know what it looks like. And I was just sort of playing, and I knew that I didn't have a goal, so I went and did the Harvard private equity course. And it's like a, one of those week-long executive courses, and I went over there. I got in, which was good. Uh, they had 3,000 applicants. They, so they like they like diversity. They wanted one startup. We were basically a startup, so they wanted us in there, and we did the startup thing. And um, and I remember putting on my application that we had two people and 25 million of assets under management. And he said, "Mark, I couldn't believe this tiny company with only 25 million under management." I said, "Josh, that's a forecast. <laughs> we don't have 25 million under management." <laughs> so anyway, you got to do what you got to do, right? Just tell the story and backfill it in. And um, and so I went to this course, and then I got lucky. And, then I, and you've got to get your head out of your business. And nights like tonight help, but you've got to do a bit more than that. And think about when you're on a plane on a long trip and you finally start thinking freely. It's just such a simple thing. I had a week uh, that I booked into the Double Tree in next to Harvard, and I stayed there for a week, and I got lucky because all the Harvard lecturers, who are animals, they're absolute commercial animals. They're the best in the world. They were all free, no students there, so I spent the week with all of them. And as luck would have it, Josh learned at the head of that program, we got along. I made sure we got along, but we actually got along. And, um, and he was listing uh, in a month after six years of work for Steve Schwartzman, a business called Blackstone, which was the world's biggest private equity company and turning it into the world's biggest alternative asset manager, which basically means the biggest investor into private markets, not public markets in the world. And he was listing that in a month. And on the... The course of that week, he basically told me at the end of the week, because I couldn't work it out, that we should build a business in Australia for 10 years from now, this is 2007, to solve a problem that Australians don't know they've got, which is that they can't just keep investing in bonds, property and stocks. You just can't keep doing that. There's this massive private market of amazing private businesses, and that's where all the growth is. And so we started Blue Sky. That's when we really started. And we listed that business in January 2012. Uh, I had a five-year plan. This is a really good rule for you. I, wanna, I always forget to give this rule. I want to give this rule. The way we built it is have a five-year plan, which is very Chinese. They got the, they've got it right. Uh, a five-year plan, and then break it into six-month bite-sized chunks. The five-year plan is a story. The ten-year plan is your big story. The five-year plan is your story on the way to your big story. Don't have a vision or a mission statement or any of that. Have your story. And you need two stories. One is for your business, and one is for you. You've got to have both, and you need to take your time to work those out, because if you get them wrong, it's a real waste of 10 years. And so, which you don't really want to do, but everyone's doing that anyway, working in poxy businesses, so why would it be any different? So at the five-year mark, we were, our job was to get listed. That was our story, because what that meant was that we had to have a credible story, 
a balance sheet. We had to be profitable. We needed to be good at what we did. People needed to believe in us. I don't need to write a business plan. If we list, then we've achieved that. And so we listed, and we listed with a market cap of 33 million. Uh, we raised all the money. Our brokers raised no money because everybody thought that we were going to fail. Everybody thought we were going to fail. They were convinced of it. Our name was Blue Sky. We're from Brisbane. We must be shit. And I hate that. <laughs> and this is why I'm turning into a Queenslander because it really annoys me. And so, uh, and so then five years later, uh, when I retired, the business had a market cap of over 500 million. The investment returns from the team were 20% compounding, including fees. Uh, we had 2.1 billion under management. They've gone through three already, so just as well I left. Uh, a balance sheet of 140 million uh, and 80 to 100 people, it's now 100, mostly Queenslanders, that are taking on the world and winning. And at December, we worked out we'd created 2,200 jobs, which is direct jobs, not, not the concentric circle out, but real jobs. And that was a really cool uh, social good thing. Like, I think you've got to have a sense of purpose. And what we've done, I, I mean, I, you know, I, on that journey, I, I'm amazed at how many lives we changed for the better. To finish off on two stories, because I know I've run out of time, is, um, is we had 50% turnover for the first five years every year, and 2% every year after that. What was the difference? You've got to work out what culture it is that you need for your business. We were solving for a specific problem, which is if you invest into Elaine Stead's venture capital fund, you need to know that Elaine Stead's going to be there in 10 years with her team. So that means you need people that don't like hierarchy, that have strength of character, they're intelligent, they work hard, and they're willing to put all of their own money, assets, time, reputation into that one thing. These are special people. And we got rid of a lot of morons along the way that didn't have that. And the way we got rid of them and we stopped the rot, there's lots of things we did, but there's one thing that we did specifically when you're thinking about your own business, is most people joining your business think they've got a risk-free option. So we had a bunch of senior people that were getting interested in joining our business with great CVs, amazing CVs. Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, I hate all the bankers because I wasn't a banker, right? So you end up hating everybody because they're better than you. And so they had this amazing CVs, you know, just amazing stuff that they'd done. Two billion dollar deals in Credit Suisse in Europe. So what I would say, they, we, I always stopped hiring, that was in a really important part. The other team would hire them, they'd get the remuneration done, options, everything's done, job description, title, which we got rid of eventually, uh, and then they would sit down for coffee with me. Now, that was an hour and a half, and they were, this is, the deal's done, right? These guys are set. They're set. This is going to be amazing. I'm going to make a fortune here. And then uh, I would take them on the journey of Blue Sky, and at the end I would say this to them. I would say, Susanna, you've got this amazing CV. You've built up all this stuff. I'm looking at this piece of paper. Only you know whether... This piece of paper is you and what you did. Only you know in the moments, did you win the moments when it got hard? Did you dig in or were you on everybody else's coattails and did you leave before you dealt with the consequences of your actions? If you did that, you'll come in here and you'll spend 18 months, 12 months, two years. You'll come and tell us that you've got to leave. It's not what you expected or we'll be asking you to leave, but you'll, you'll go. Uh, and if you did do it, you'll do really well here. But if you didn't do it and you are leaving, then let me tell you, when Macquarie Bank call and say, what was Susanna like? I'm going to tell them that you were shit. <laughs> and the moment you do that, you know in the moment if that's a piece of paper or if it's them. And as soon as we did that, we had 70% of those people didn't take the jobs. They hire people like them, and when things get hard, they leave you with massive problems. Get rid of them. You don't want those people in your business. There's a lot of them around. They're full of shit. Get them out of your business. You can't afford to have them in there. And we started hiring, and the people that reacted well, some people had to sleep on it overnight because they're the digesters, but they got there. <laughs> and we stopped hiring bad people. We've had 2% turnover since. The business is killing it. Uh, it's a great team. And I was in a position at the end of 10 years that I could retire from the business and hand it over to the team because that was the best thing for the business and for the team and for my kids and my wife. And that's a privilege. And so now I'm doing this cheap entrepreneur thing, which will be over on October 12th, and everyone will be sick of hearing from me. So that's enough for me, I think. <laughs>